1961, in the town of Moxton. Dear Aiden, Knowing you, I'm sure you are already worried about me. Rest assured, I'm fine. I am now in a town called Moxton. I've tracked them this far, and I think they'll settle here. Like, no more. Moxton is a town that attracts evil. I'm staying at the Sack Sky Hotel near the orphanage. I also found a new little assistant here. If he continues to do well, we'll have to hire him on as a third partner. I'm following a lead that has to do with the construction of a new prison. Since I've been following this lead, I've had the feeling that I'm being followed and watched. If you don't hear from me in a week, I could probably use some help, but it won't come to that. I'll be in touch again soon. Give my regards to your parents. In loyal friendship, yours, Janice Keebler. This was the fifth time Aiden Goodman had read the letter from his good friend and business partner. He put it in his bag and set off. As he did every morning, young Jimmy Jones went into town and picked up the latest edition of the Moxton Daily News for the supervisor, Marilyn. The fact that she entrusted little Jimmy with the ten pennies day after day made him proud. And as he did every morning, he read the paper himself before taking it to Marilyn. He still did this in the city because the children weren't allowed to read newspapers in the orphanage. Marilyn said there were things in there for adults only. That was a rule that was introduced especially for Jimmy. The 11-year-old was one of the few children who could read it all. He was also the only one who was at all interested in newspaper articles. As always, he was allowed to sit in the waiting area of Old Willie's Hairdressing Salon to read the newspaper. Two brothers have to stick together in times like these, he told himself. Jimmy hurried through the pages to find the article that really interested him. He found what he was looking for on the second page. The newspaper was calling them a gang of murderers. Either they hadn't understood what the Inferno really was, or they were afraid to call them by their name. Either way, Jimmy was relieved to see that the cultist's latest victim was a man. That meant that good Miss Keebler was still alive. Still, he was worried. She had been missing for two days now. While the orphan boy was delivering the newspaper to its owner, the Inferno was busy with important business meetings just a couple of streets away. Officer Marston found himself tied to a chair. He had a few scratches on his face and a laceration over his left eye. A lot of sweat was dripping into it, which made it sting a little. His modern blue uniform was completely soaked, but he couldn't stop sweating. He was so scared, he was scared to death. He hadn't been able to see the attacker himself, but he knew exactly who'd kidnapped him and his partner. It was no coincidence that they had been struck from behind as they followed a trail to the Inferno. Directly in front of Marston sat his partner, Dick Freeman, also tied to a chair. Unlike him, however, he had a large sack over his head. He had probably woken up during the transport and was not supposed to know where he was going. Now, he heard footsteps in the large deserted hall and was sweating even more than before. A strong hand grabbed him by the neck, only to remove the gag from his mouth. So, Mr. Marston, we're delighted to have you with us. Can we offer you something? The officer said nothing. He couldn't yet assess the inferno and didn't want to provoke any of the cultists. Perfectly happy, that's how I like them best. Do you have any idea why you're here, officer? Asked the man in the brown trench coat, who was now standing between him and his colleague. It was not a good sign that he revealed his face to him. We probably found out about you and you didn't like it, he said, trying to read the reaction in his captor's eyes. That's almost cute. They read tracks we laid out for them. We wanted to talk to them. I'd say we have an offer for them that they can't refuse. You want to negotiate something? You better kidnap the prosecutor. I don't think there's anything I can do for you. You're a real joker. I like that. You'll work for us. You'll cover us. They'll cover our tracks. You'll convince others to leave us alone. They'll be our little lapdog, said the cultist. He clapped his hands and pointed over to Marston's colleague, Freeman. Two more cultists 
came out of the shadows. One pushed Marston's chair closer to his colleague, and the other pulled the sack off his head. The officer's eyes had been removed. as had his throat. Marston had to pull himself together. He was going to throw up, but he didn't want to show any weakness in front of the Satanists. If they didn't sit down or refuse to pick up the stick... We'll do this to your wife and two daughters. You better get them to stop, and they'll watch. We're all over the city, at school, in the supermarket, even in their house. Do you understand me? Marston believed them. He was sure that they were capable of carrying out their threats. The only reason he was still alive was because they needed him. Yes, I'll play along, he said. Fine. Fine. And now do it all over again like a good dog. Bark. Officer Marston barked. The cultist in the trench coat wasn't laughing. He was serious. That's a good dog. Now make your colleague's body disappear. He's already starting to stink. The demon worshippers undid his restraints and then left him alone with his partner's body. Officer Marston huddled on the floor and wept. On the other side of town... Jimmy Jones didn't notice. He was sent out again that afternoon to deliver letters to the post office. On the way, he noticed a guy across the street who looked like the one who had been watching Miss Keebler. He was loitering in front of the candy store, watching the passers-by. Maybe he knew where they had taken his girlfriend. The man noticed the boy's stare. Jimmy was paralyzed as he started to walk across the street. Suddenly, an automobile stopped right in front of young Jimmy and the door opened. Jump in. I'm not one of them. Hurry up. If the orphan boy hadn't recognized Aiden from Miss Keebler's description, he wouldn't have gotten in. But he did, and they drove away from the cultist. I'm Aiden Goodman. That was a member of the Inferno. They heard I was coming to town and now are very vigilant. You're Jimmy, aren't you? Yes, how, how, how do you do, sir? I've never been in an automobile before. I haven't either. Not very often, anyway. I'm sure you know that our mutual friend Miss Keebler's disappeared, said Aiden. I'm here to look for her. Maybe we should look for her together, Jimmy replied. Aiden smiled. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we should. Just a few kilometers away, outside the city, was the mental hospital. In the wing for dangerous offenders. In the furthest padded cell available, an old acquaintance of Aiden's was whimpering. Pastor Morrison lay hunched in a corner, as usual, sometimes twitching and staring at the wall. He could still feel the flames, which he only imagined eating away at his body. Sometimes he fell asleep from exhaustion but woke up screaming for a, a short time. His existence was like a stay in hell, the visitor thought to himself. Only now did the pastor notice that there was someone else in the room. Trembling and twitching, he sat up and stared at the man standing next to his mattress. He was hallucinating so much that he didn't know if it was real or not. Who are you? He strained to get out. My name is... Belial. I'm here to talk business. The demon's eyes flashed red. He had now found a true master of lies. The collaboration between the two would soon bear fruit. He was sure of it. The next day, Aiden took Jimmy to his new estate outside the city. He had bought it as a new base for their operations against the forces of hell and also wanted to use it as motivation to make the whole area cultist free. It was strange for little Jimmy to be confronted with so much wealth. In the orphanage, they slept with 40 other children in a large hall and only a few kilometers away there was a house 10 times that size but with a lot fewer people. Uh, that was absurd. Nevertheless, the boy was fascinated. The entrance hall the entrance hall was huge. The floor was made up of marble, and the furniture was incredibly expensive. But what he liked best was the cellar. Or, or rather, one particular part of it. Aiden called it the safe room. 
There was no expensive furniture here, but there were pentagrams and other protective signs that prevented any demon from moving outside the designated boundaries. <laughs> At least in theory. Because the safe room had not yet been tested. Your house is really great, boss, said Jimmy. Thank you. I thought you'd like it. I've got another surprise for you later. I hope you like it, too, replied Aiden. He was a little uncomfortable with Jimmy calling him boss. <clears throat> please, please excuse me, gentlemen. A, a message came in for you. Mr. Goodman, the Inferno struck yesterday in broad daylight in the library. There was one fatality. Tony, Aiden's butler, was as privy to the operation against the Inferno as anyone else who worked in the house. The news that they had struck again came as no surprise to Aiden. The fact that they were now murdering in public buildings in broad daylight did. If they were taking such a risk, it must have been an important mission, he concluded. Jimmy and Aiden made their way to Moxton to talk to possible witnesses. <laughs> okay, Jimmy, uh, listen carefully. They hit the library for a reason. I think they were looking for a book or several. If those books are still there and they're not available for loan... Then, well, I still want them. I'll donate an appropriate amount to the library for them, so I wouldn't say we're stealing them. Well, well, actually, we are going to steal them. Uh, put them in this bag while I create a distraction. Uh, sometimes it's an advantage to be famous. I guess so, boss, said Jimmy. I think you're right. You're here for a reason. Miss Keebler and I found out they were looking for something at the site where they're building the prison. And now... They've obviously been looking for something in the library. It's probably texts about their Master Bilal or other demons. They're up to something, and we should find out what it is. The author had to marvel again at the intellect Jimmy possessed. You wouldn't think you were talking to an 11-year-old when you listened to him talk like that. Julie Summers was torn from her dark thoughts about yesterday when she saw a familiar face in the corner of her eye. It wasn't an acquaintance or a family member. It was someone she knew from the newspaper. Of course she did. It was him. Mr. Goodman, she shouted with excitement. Aiden thought it was a good sign that the librarian recognized him as soon as he entered the hall. He smiled. That's me. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance, Miss... Summers. Julie Summers is my name. I'm a great fan of your novel, sir, Julie replied. Well, I am honored, Miss Summers. Very honored. If you have one of my books, I'd be happy to sign it for you. Julie's eyes were shining now. But then she remembered something. The author had a connection to the Inferno. According to the newspaper reports, he had made sure that her operation in No More was prevented. That'd be nice, Mr. Goodman, but that's not why you're here, is it? Are they after the Inferno again? asked Julie. To be honest, yes. I don't know how much you've read about what happened in No More, but it was awful. These people leave a trail of blood, murder, and madness. I want to do my best to put as many of them behind bars as possible. I know. I was there, Mr. Goodman. I saw them kill young Betsy Keener. It was cruel. What kind of monsters do that? she asked as her eyes filled with tears. Jimmy, whom she only noticed now, handed her a handkerchief, which she gladly accepted with a smile. I'm sorry you had to see that, Miss Summers. Can you give me any clues that would be valuable to our investigation? Aiden asked as Julie put the now-used handkerchief away. You knew what you were doing, Mr. Goodman. They knew exactly what they were looking for. It was a book, but they didn't know where it was. One of them found this room. When they went out again, I could see it. It was encased in some kind of metal. It said Siglium Satanicum on it, or something like that. I guess that's the title of the book, Siglium Satanicum. It didn't mean anything to Aiden, but the information could prove important later. He asked Julie if they could take a look at the chamber and were surprised when she didn't object. He thought the area would be cordoned off by the police, but it wasn't. The door was large and made of solid steel. 
there was a large pentagram on it. The victim's dried blood could still be seen on it. The chamber itself looked terribly old and smelled musty. The stone pedestal in the middle of the room was, of course, empty. This was probably where the Sigillium Satanicum had been, Aiden thought to himself. There were a few cobweb-covered shelves on the walls. There were still about a dozen books in all. Uh, that was good. Miss Summers, I assume these books here are not part of the library's inventory, but you still lend them to me for a period of time, wouldn't you? Aiden asked without much hope of a positive answer. Take them with you and keep them. I don't even want them here or near me anymore. They give off such a cold vibe, and the police aren't interested. They weren't interested in the whole case. Oh, well, thank you very much, Miss Summers. Jimmy, uh, put the books in the bag, will you? Oh, and Miss Summers, I have one last question. The officers who investigated the case, do you know them or were they new in town? Aiden asked. It was Officer Marston and one of his colleagues. I think the man's name is Richards. Normally, Dick Freeman is his partner, but I think he's ill. But, but they're not new. Then Aiden couldn't explain the police's lack of motivation. In no more, they had infiltrated the police and thus had control of the town. Apparently, that maybe wasn't the case here. Aiden and Jimmy politely thanked Julie, and Aiden signed a copy of his latest work for her, as he promised. As they drove back to the new headquarters, Julie looked at Aiden's signature. It wasn't much, but it took her mind off the bad thoughts. I'm glad I didn't have to steal the books, boss, Jimmy said as they drove to the estate. <laughs> Me too, Jimmy. Listen, I know you're smarter than others your age, and you've attracted the Inferno's attention, but I still need to know if you're sure you want to keep helping me with this. Otherwise, I can't reconcile it in my conscience. Yes, boss, I'm in, no matter what. I've seen what the Inferno is doing now, and I can't just look the other way. If I am stopped now, I'd blame myself for the rest of my life. I can't stop. But I've got to get back to the orphanage today or Marilyn will worry, Jimmy replied. As for that, don't worry about it. I told you I had a surprise for you. It was only when they arrived and Aiden showed him the signed adoption papers that Jimmy understood. The famous and rich author Aiden Goodman had actually adopted him. It was a strange feeling. According to Aiden, it was the only way he could protect Jimmy. He was no longer safe from the inferno at the orphanage, and Aiden was relieved to see that the boy was happy about the whole deal. He had been afraid that he might refuse to be adopted. Aiden didn't know what made a good father, and he told Jimmy he wouldn't try to be one. He would just continue to be his friend and try to protect him. Jimmy, Jimmy felt remorseful that he was now so much better off than the other children in the orphanage. Officer Marston also felt remorse but for very different reasons. He was on his way to the storeroom where evidence from past murder cases was stored. This afternoon, a member of the Inferno had visited him at work. He just walked in without fear of being arrested. Marston had no choice and went with him to his office. There he revealed to the officer that he didn't have to pick up his daughters from school today because the Inferno had already done that for him. Hey, don't worry, they'd be safe and not a hair on their heads would be harmed. But only if he did his job. By 10 p.m., he had to get them a book that had been stored in the evidence room as evidence in a murder case. Otherwise, his daughters would suffer the same fate as his partner, Dick. It was terrible to lie to Dick's wife all the time. He told her he would do anything to find Dick, but that was a lie because, well, he knew exactly where he was. He had weighed his body down with stones and dumped it in the river after the Inferno had killed him. Seeing Dick's wife suffer was unbearable for him. He had also lied to his own wife. He had told her he was taking the children to visit a friend so she wouldn't worry. Marston now entered the building where the storeroom was located. Officer Albert Brenson was sitting at a small desk in front of the door to the storeroom and greeted Marston. They knew each other from their training. Albert said he only needed the written order from above. Then Marston would have to fill out the form and he could help himself to his treasure trove. Of course, well, there was no 
order from above. Marston tried to talk his way out of it, and he was on to something, but Albert didn't understand. He was sorry, but he couldn't let his friend into the storeroom without orders. Marston looked at his watch. He still had half an hour. Despair spread through him, and tears ran down his cheeks. Officer Brenson stood up and asked him what was wrong. What's wrong, my friend? And can I help you somehow? If Marston would just tell him what was going on... But he couldn't. A shot rang out. Brenson slumped back into his chair. His modern uniform now had a hole right next to the left breast pocket. Marston also slumped to the floor. He was crying. How low had he sunk? Now he was just as bad as the murderers he usually herded. But he had no choice. His daughters needed him. He took the book from the chamber and replaced it with the one that he'd brought with him. Then he stole a knife from another murder case and dropped the box in which it was stored on the floor. This was to lead his colleagues on the wrong track. Two days later, Jimmy and Aiden prepared to perform the ritual. They'd studied some of the books until they found a way to summon the Librarian of Hell. The demon's name was Alfk, and he demanded a whole liter of his summoner's blood as a price for his services. Aiden took this procedure upon himself and drew the blood. It was now in a bowl in the safe room where Aiden and Jimmy were. He then lit the herbs in the center of the pentagram and spoke the incantation formula. Damon Alfks, esto subjecto voluntani mita. Ti invaco a profundus inferni. The earth trembled slowly and briefly. The candles in the room flickered, and the demon appeared in the center of the pentagram. Aiden and Jimmy were amazed at its appearance. The demon was less than a meter tall, had no skin, and his face looked like that of an old man. At your service is Alfk, a self-appointed librarian of hell. You must be wise if you seek my help. Tell me your request. I have much to do. The servant of hell now had his eye on the bowl of Aiden's blood and licked his lips. We thank you for coming. We need to know what a group called the Inferno is up to in the city of Moxton. They have stolen the Sigillium Satanicum. Can you help us, asked Aiden? Alf grinned broadly and pointed to the bowl of blood. Aiden carefully handed it to him inside the pentagram. The demon grabbed it and drank eagerly. It only took him a few seconds to consume the entire leader. No, I can't tell you that. I'm not a bloody clairvoyant. What do you think I am? But yes, I can help you. There is a demon who sees everything, past, present, and future. Summoning him is not easy, but it can be done. Take a piece of paper and a pen, and I'll tell you the ingredients, the ritual, and the incantation. By the way, the pentagram is not necessary. I don't attack customers. That would be rude. And I particularly enjoy doing business with you. It's very rare to drink the blood of such a righteous man when one lives in hell. Aiden felt queasy at the thought that the creature had drunk his blood and thus learned something about his nature. Nevertheless, he took the pen and paper and wrote everything down, and then the demon said goodbye. There was another demon a few kilometers away in the mental hospital. At least, well, that's where he appeared. Bilal thought it was time to send the pastor to his destiny, or, on his last visit, he taught the old man how to endure his terrible torment, and now it's over. He was no longer allowed to fight it, but he had to accept the eternal pain and live with it. Morrison managed to do this better and better. Sometimes he winced a little, but, but that became less and less. You've been practicing. That's good. I think it's time. Are you ready? Asked the Lord of Lies. Yes, my lord, I am ready, Bilal, my lord, replied Master of Lies. Then take my gift. It is a weapon that will make you stronger. Take it and find my followers in the city. They are already waiting for your guidance. 
Yes, my lord. Morrison took the golden, ruby-crusted dagger that lay on his mattress. It was beautiful. Then the door opened and the pastor made his way to bloody well freedom. The dagger gave him strength, making him stronger than he had ever been, even as a young man. He had never, never felt so good and strong. Meanwhile, Janice Keebler was still in a world that was not hers. She was in Terusa. More of that in the next episode. Janice Keebler had been following the Inferno for quite a long time. The latest lead took her to the construction site of the new prison in Moxton. Hmm. She'd seen them walking around there this afternoon looking for something. Uh, but they found nothing. That gave Janice the chance to go look on herself. It was now the middle of the night and the building site itself was completely deserted. She hadn't brought a lantern with her because she wanted to remain undetected at all costs. The moon provided enough light out here to be able to see something. She'd been searching the site for over an hour now, but found nothing that seemed out of the ordinary, and she was about to walk back toward the hotel when she noticed something. At first, it was just kind of a vibration that she felt in the center of her chest, near her heart. Then she noticed another smell. It smelled intensely of flowers. The vibration and the smell seemed to come from the already finished basement of the prison. She carefully walked down the cement steps and then continued to follow the smell of the flowers. It finally led her to a cell that had not yet been completed. Only the holes for the toilet were already finished here. Nothing else was visible. The smell couldn't possibly have come from here, but the vibration was also stronger here than on the rest of the construction site, and somehow the rear end of the cell it kind of looked strange. The wall looked as if it was just a mirror image, and the mirror itself had a crack in the middle. Janice walked toward the wall to examine it, uh, but then she fell. She fell for a few seconds, and the scent of the flowers grew stronger. She felt so sick from falling that she couldn't think straight. She just let the falling happen. Then she landed. She landed on soft grass. What was that? She said to herself as she raised her head. It was all so bright. It took a moment for her eyes to adjust to the blazing midday sun. But it was night. Shortly afterwards, she saw the sea of flowers she had smelled in prison. But that made no sense. How had she gotten here? And why was it actually broad daylight? Janice was sure that she hadn't been asleep. She looked around and could only see meadows, a fallow land, and a few trees far and wide. So there was nothing left to do but wander around for a while. After a few hours, Janice discovered a house. It was in the middle of nowhere. She wandered up to the house and examined it from the outside. She could see through the windows that there was no one in the living room. The owner didn't seem to have any fields or at least a well outside either, so her hopes of finding some provisions vanished. They were helpless. Janice was startled when something fell over behind the small house. It must have been a bucket or something similar. So slowly and carefully, she crept around the house and saw something even more terrifying than the inferno. The man she saw was so badly decomposed that his face was completely caved in and his skin looked like leather. His eyeballs were missing. And yet he could still see Janice. Somehow, at least, he could see because he walked straight toward her. Janice was too perplexed to move, and she was sure that this would be the end of her. Then a, a thick bar of metal or a stone struck the skull of the living dead guy, and he slumped to the ground. Young lady, you should not be out here alone. These creatures are lurking everywhere, said an old man. He wore a gray robe, had long gray hair, and an equally gray and long beard. The staff also seemed to serve him as a walking stick. Perhaps he was the resident of this house. 
Excuse me, sir, I didn't mean to bother you. This is the first time I've heard of these creatures. Are you the owner of this house? She asked. The old man eyed her critically. You're not from around here, are you? What's your name, missy? No, I currently live in a town called Moxton. My name is Janice Keebler, sir, replied the former maid. There's no Moxton here. Here in Tarusa, there are wall kingdoms like Hondura, Duran, Saiyan, and a few others. Then there are a few kingdoms east of the sea. The rest fell a long time ago. I'm afraid, dear Janice Keebler, you're a long way from home, he said kindly. I have that suspicion, too. Uh, may I rest in your house for a while, Mr... asked Janice. Call me Myrden. Without the mister, please. And this isn't my house. I don't even think it's a house. It was created as an illusion to stop a group of heroes I'm pursuing and desperately need to join. <laughs> and that's uncomfortable. Uh, did, do you know any way I could get home, Myrden? Perhaps. It depends on exactly how you got here, child. Join me on my wanderings and, and tell me what happened before you got here. Janice told him about the Inferno and her encounters with the cult, but when she mentioned the demon Bilal, Myrden's eyes perked up. His ears opened up. He seemed to worry him that the Lord of Lies has a hand in it. At dinner, Janice realized that Myrden was obviously a wizard. Perhaps not an incredibly powerful one, but he could light the campfire and create a meal and bread from nothing. As they ate, he told the young woman about the adventurers he was pursuing. They were trying to stop the man of peace, but Myrden feared they were hopelessly outmatched without him. So he had to catch up with them as quickly as possible. According to Myrden, this, this man of peace served hell, just as Bilal did. So they were fighting more or less the same battle. That made Janice a little proud. In No More, she was still a frightened maid. And now, she was sitting around a campfire with a wizard and being compared to a group of heroes. She had changed. She knew that. She was ready to face the forces of hell. Whether in Moxton or here in Tarusa with Myrden. The wizard also told her that there were portals of corridors that lay between the worlds and could lead from Tarusa to her world, if she could find the right one. However, these portals were not easy to use, so Myrden thought Janice had hit a weak spot. These weak points are unpredictable. They could shoot you through space and time without you being able to influence your destination or target time. Being familiar with the magic of the corridors, she could recognize a kind of imprint on Janice. The weak spot that had brought her here was still there, according to Myrden, but it had migrated. It was further north of where she was now. Janice was glad that she was on Myrden's route. The wizard could not have interrupted his journey to help her. After all, the fate of this entire world depended on this mission. The next day, they encountered two undead that Merlin easily fended off. He even shot a fireball at the second attacker. Perhaps it was a little more talented than Janice had previously thought. Around the campfire, they told each other stories from their respective worlds again. Janice talked about little Jimmy and how clever he was for his age. Marilyn talked about his past and how he had met the man of peace a long time ago. It sounded as if the two were... It sounded as if the two of them had once been friends, despite their differences. Before going to bed, Myrden gave her an incredibly beautiful white dagger. He said that he had intended to give it to one of the adventurers, but somehow it felt like the dagger belonged to Janice. The dagger felt good in her hand. It felt real. With the ornate dagger in her hand, she fell asleep and dreamt of home. Over the next few days, they marched on through small forests and barren landscapes. Janice marveled at how beautiful this world was. She could only imagine what wonders still lay hidden here. Five days later, 
they were close to their destination. Mirden could sense that the weak spot was close. When we catch sight of the weak spot, run, run, Miss Janice, don't look back. It'll be fine, I'll be fine, and I'll always remember our camaraderie. I will too, Mirden, but do you think it's necessary to run? Will the weak link wander again if you don't? No, it isn't. We've been tracked for some time now. A few of them have gathered. Just don't be afraid, though. I'll be fine. A short time later, they discovered a small clearing in the forest. At the end of it, looked as if the forest was a little distorted, as if the mirror was broken. That was the weak point. Mirden had been right. Behind them and also in front of them, monsters. Several monsters emerged from the bushes. They were not only undead, but also hideous hybrids. She could see human spiders, human beetles, and even human-like snakes. Run, Miss Janice, run. Don't look back. Our friendship will endure. Thank you, Mirden, Janice stated, and she started running, trying to avoid the monsters. It wasn't that difficult, as they seemed to focus more on the wizard. There were more and more monsters. There were about 30 of them now, Janice estimated. The weak spot was right up ahead, but, but she didn't want her friend to sacrifice herself for her. If the price of her return home was Mirren's death, then she wasn't prepared to pay it. But now, she had to put off worrying about the friend until later. An undead appeared right in front of her. It wasn't as fast as the animal monsters, but it was still a danger. Janice remembered that Mirden had told her, always aim for the skull, no matter what, always aim for the skull. And that's what she did now. Janice took the white dagger and aimed for the head. The attempt failed miserably, and she stabbed him in the chest instead. Then something strange happened. The living dead man paused. He looked thoughtful, and she could sense his thoughts. I am dead. What has become of me? That's not me. I am dead. That's the truth. The man, who used to be called Rainier, as she knew that now, sank to his knees first and then fell to the ground for good. Yes, he was dead. The weak spot was now within her grasp. She could feel it. The vibration was back. But her conscience plagued her. Before she fully entered the weak spot, she turned to Mirden. The hordes of undead and monsters were held back by a powerful fire that seemed to come from his walking staff. And at the same moment, they were struck by mighty lightning bolts that the mage rained down on them from the sky. The monsters flocked and the mage smiled at her. Then Janice Keebler fell. She fell and fell and fell until she landed on the hard concrete floor of the unfinished prison cell. It was night, but she didn't think it was the same night she walked through the first weak spot. Aiden Goodman and little Jimmy were unaware of her return. They were back in the safe room and about to summon another demon. The ingredients that Offak the hell librarian had told them were already burning in the bowl provided. The pentagram was complete with the signs needed to hold the demon captive. Now, it was time to say the incantation. Demon Arebus, esto subjecto voluntari mea. Te invoca a profundus inferni. Te invoca a profundus inferni. Te invoca a profundus inferni. The demon that appeared in the pentagram this time did not resemble Alf at all. The dark figure hovered far above the ground. Its black robe seemed to be made of some kind of smoke. The demon's body itself was nothing but pure darkness. Only its eyes glowed red under the ghostly hood. What is this? Who summoned me? Asked Erebus. I, I am Aiden Goodman. I, I need your help, replied the author. Erebus came flying to the edge of the pentagram and was now less than three feet away from Aiden. 
obviously the added signs were working, and not letting the demon of prophecy out of his prison. I once prophesied the man of peace to be the greatest servant of hell. I prophesied what the swordsman and his friends are currently doing in Terusa. I even prophesied that the kings of monsters would die and the princes of hell would be imprisoned. And now I'm supposed to predict the weather for a whimpering amateur. Aiden summoned up all of his courage to stand up to this demon. If he wanted to continue on this path, he had to learn not to be intimidated by them. You are to do what you're meant to. I have summoned you and I have you at my disposal, he said. I, I want to know what the Inferno, Belial's followers, what, what are they all up to in this city? Why do they steal the book and what is their next move? The author asked confidently. Ah, Belial's followers. You're the author. Very well. You get my prophecy. And I get my freedom in return. The deal is binding. Don't try to break it. The Inferno stole the Sigillium Satanicum to acquire knowledge of the Sigillus. Like the other princes of hell, Belial is locked up in a prison sealed with 66 Sigils. The seals are described in the book, and how to break them. You can predict their next move yourself now, but just in case you're not quite up to speed, you will break them. Then Belial will be free. And he'll remember you, Arthur. I certainly hope so, he said. I taught him a lesson about lying, after all. Now, go back to hell. With his foot, Aiden carefully erased the mark, making it impossible for the demon to escape to hell. It didn't stop him now, but the demon was still there. Your future is interesting, Arthur. I cannot fully recognize it. You are blurring in time. Make sure you don't get lost in it. Time is shaking. We will meet again. Then the dark specter was gone, and Aiden could breathe a sigh of relief with the demon out of there. B but could he really? The demon knew who he was, and he predicted an unclear future for him. Boss, if the Inferno is really trying to break those seals, then we have to stop them, said Jimmy. Yeah, but it might be harder than we think. We don't know what the seals are, so how can we stop them from breaking them? Jimmy says, good point, boss. Maybe there's a second book that describes the seals. Or we can steal the book from those scoundrels. I'm sure they've already multiplied the list of sigils, and maybe we'd be on the same level of knowledge. Aiden thought that maybe Jimmy was making things a little too easy for himself. For the moment, he was glad that they could protect themselves from the inferno. Going on the offensive against them... Eh, that was something entirely different. They were also aware of the existence of a second book. The ones they had from the library chamber didn't say anything about the seals. Suddenly there was a knock at the door. Sir, it's me, Tony. We have a guest. What? This late? Hmm. Who is it, Tony? It's Miss Keebler, sir. Jimmy and Aiden looked at each other. They hurried to the stairs to the first floor and saw Janice standing in the doorway. All three smiled and Jimmy ran into her arms. Aiden also went to her and put a hand on her shoulder. I'm so glad you're all right, Janice. We have a lot to share. Janice had to laugh. Oh, you wouldn't believe how much I have to tell you, Aiden. When I got your message at the hotel, I was glad you took care of Jimmy. My biggest worry was that the cultists would get him and hurt him. Uh, but they hadn't. Because they were busy with something completely different. They had finally found their master. Pastor Morrison was with them in their hideout in the caves outside of Moxton. They had decorated a large part of the cave to look like a church. Like a dark church. The many crosses hung upside down, of course. 
Dozens of members of the Inferno had gathered here to listen to their preacher. My dear congregation, we have gathered here today to celebrate. To celebrate that, with the help of Officer Marston's book, we were able to decipher the seals. The pastor winced briefly. The pain that came from the imaginary bursting of his skin overwhelmed him, uh, but only for a second. He grimaced and then continued. To you, my dear congregation and our dear guests, I will now reveal the first seal. Pastor Morrison, who was once again wearing his red robe, cleared his throat and prepared himself for the big moment. And the first seal was broken when the man of God turned his back on his God and turned to hell. I am not ashamed to say that the man of God is me. We will now perform the ritual of dark baptism. This will make me a child of hell and break the seal. The cultists, the cultists were amazed. Their guest, Jenny Miller, tried to scream again, but the rag in her mouth prevented it. She was hanging upside down from the largest inverted cross in the entire dark church. They had already removed her clothes when one of the Satan worshippers carried out the procedure. They said they had to make sure she was really a virgin. At first, the shame was the worst thing about her nakedness. But now, it was the cold that affected the young woman the most. Pastor Morrison walked over to her. His face was exactly level with hers, so he could look her straight in the eye. Begin! the pastor shouted. The young woman screamed again, but these cries also fell silent. Two cultists, each with a knife, climbed up two ladders that stood to the left and right of the cross. They plunged their knives into the woman's abdomen, whose horrific scream could now be heard even through the rag in her mouth. Then they cut along the stomach on the respective sides so that a massive gush of warm blood ran down the woman and dripped onto the pastor. He grabbed her almost lifeless head and kissed her. The blood that ran into her mouth and the old man's stinking breath were the last things she noticed. Then the earth began to shake. We have done it, my dear congregation. The first seal has been broken. We are the disciples of the true God, the Prince Belial. We are the chosen ones. We are united. We are one. Now let us complete our work. A short time later, the Inferno's new lapdog was given the task of watching the author and his friends. The three of them had a lot of fun with Willie in his barber shop. Officer Marston saw them from across the street. He was quite happy with this assignment. It was better than having to kill someone again. Now, later, he arrived at the agreed meeting point in the warehouse, and he was sure that this, this was not their headquarters, and that drove him crazy. He had nothing at all on these criminals, nothing. He was still at their mercy. As always, he entered the great hall when prompted. Sit down, the cultists ordered him. Officer Marston sat down on the floor. Good dog, now report to your master. They were in the city, all three of them, but they didn't do anything of importance. The woman bought a book and the author took the boy to the hairdresser. Then they had on ice cream and drove off again. They looked pretty carefree. That's how it should be, very good. You're a good boy now. Listen carefully. The next task is important. Your superior, Chief Calder, is a thorn in our side. You may not know it, but he's getting dangerously close to us. Take him out and bring us his body. No, I can't do that. That man trained me. He's like a father to me, pleaded Marston. If you talk back one more time, I'll cut off both your wife's legs and then beat your children to death with them. Tomorrow, the chief will be dead. Do you understand? Y yes, replied the officer in a brittle voice. Good. I knew you were a good boy. Now, eat your food and go back to work. 
As usual, uh, another cultist placed a bowl of dog food in front of him. Marston was now good at suppressing the urge to vomit. As requested, he ate it up and then left the building. Before he could go home, he hid in an alley. He crouched down on the ground. He cried and threw up. After he recovered, he drove home in the company car. There were an unusually large number of people on his street. They were just walking in one direction or another without doing anything conspicuous. But Marston knew that some of them belonged to the Inferno. He had already seen some of them rummaging around in his garden. He sometimes heard noises in his house at night. Hell, were they in his house? How was this all going to end? He didn't know. One day later, Chief Calder made his way to the part of Moxton that everyone referred to as Sin City. There was illegal gambling, street fights, and plenty of prostitutes. He had found a note from Officer Marston on his desk. He absolutely had to meet him here. It would be about the Inferno. Chief Calder had been working on the Inferno for a long time, and if it was about the murdering cultists, it made sense that Marston would want to meet him in a remote location. He came into the alley and saw his former student was already waiting for him. Well, my boy, fire away. I don't want to stay here for any longer than I have to. I, I work for them, Chief, for quite a while now. They're forcing me. They're following me. They're stalking the girls. They're at my house. Hell, they're in my house. I'm, I'm so sorry, Chief. I, I'm so sorry. Immediately, Chief Calder thought of the evidence room break-in where Officer Brenson was shot. Damn. What had that kid done? It's all right, my boy. It's good that you came to me. We'll figure this out. You hear me? We'll work it out. Marston cried bitterly as his teacher, who was also a father figure, took him in his arms and comforted him. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Chief, he whimpered. Marston had drawn his pistol and pressed it into Calder's round belly. He realized what was going on and put his hands up. Marston took a step back. I'm so sorry, Chief. They're going to do something terrible to Shirley and the kids if I don't kill you tonight, Marston said. I understand. They killed Dick, too, didn't they? asked Chief Calder. Yes. They forced me to make his body disappear. I've had to lie to his wife ever since. It breaks my heart to see her like this, and now I, I don't know what to do. Do it, said Calder. What? Do it. I love the girls as much as you do. If something happened to them, I couldn't live with it, so do it. But Chief... Do it. But you have to promise me one thing. You have to stop them. You can't be saved, but you can't stop her. Take my documents from the right-hand desk drawer, gain their trust, and then destroy them. And now do it. Then he shot. Marston wept bitterly. The chief was right. He could no longer be saved. His path led straight to hell. He had to wait another half hour until the Inferno arrived to inspect the body. When the time came, he had wiped all the tears from his face and pretended not to care. That really made an impression on the cultists. In his mind, however, he was already planning on how he could slaughter as many of them as possible. By now, Marston looked terrible. He hadn't been home for two days and he hadn't showered or washed, and he was nasty. He was aware that his wife and daughters were worried about it, but that was okay. It was even necessary, because they had to get used to his absence. Chief Calder had told him the truth before he shot him. He had told him that he was beyond saving, and, and he had been right. I'm scum. I'm filth. I'm a murderer, and my path leads me straight to hell, Marston thought to himself. But his family would not go to hell. They would live and without him. Instead of fighting back, he gave himself completely to this role. And he was good at it. 
He had just dropped off his delivery at the warehouse. It was a few dozen firearms that he'd stolen from the police warehouse. While some cultists checked the goods, Marston sat patiently on the floor and waited for his dog food. You're a good dog. You're well trained. You do sit without command, and your delivery was not only on time, but also high quality. You're trying really hard. Of course, sir. I want to be a good boy. You don't seem to take much interest in your family anymore, either. Or is that just a trick? asked the cultist. Not a trick. I have only one family. The Inferno is my family now. I didn't think so when we first met, but you've made it yourself. You've become one of us, good boy. I now have some food. Another cultist placed the bowl of dog food in front of him as usual. Instead of eating it with his hands like a human, Marston stuck his head in his bowl and devoured the dog food. While the cultist felt superior and was sure that by humiliating the officer he would have broken him and made him subservient, Marston thought of what he would soon do. Not just yet, but soon. Soon I'll slaughter you all, and then we'll all go to hell together. After he'd finished eating, he was allowed to leave. Marston had rented a room in a hotel in Sin City. He went there, this time without throwing up and crying. He was able to cope with the humiliation. His thoughts were clear. Clearer than perhaps ever before in his life. He had a mission, and he would fulfill it. In front of his mirror in this shabby room, he practiced drawing his revolver again and again. He had always been fast, uh, but that was not enough for him. So far in his career, the officer had never had to be fast. The crooks he faced were no real threat. But the Inferno, well, the Inferno was different. They were a pack of killers ready to kill. And there were a lot of them. At least he hoped so. He would prefer to kill them all. But if there were 20 of them in the end, he could die with a clear conscience. Janice Keebler and Aidan Goodman were also preparing to attack the Inferno. It had taken some time, but Janice was able to convince Aidan that Mirden had told her in a dream what the fourth seal was. Sixty-six children had to die at the hands of a righteous soul to break it. Even for the Inferno, murdering innocent children was a new low. The author and his partner cleaned their firearms, filled some vials with holy water, and carved crosses into the silver bullets. They were aware that it was possible that they would be forced to shoot people. They would be members of the cult, but they were human, too. They were both willing, although they weren't sure what it would do to them if they took a human life. The only place nearby where more than 66 children were already gathered was the orphanage Aiden had adopted Jimmy from. That's why they had their sources watching it. That's the way they could intervene as quickly as possible if the Inferno decided to carry out its disgusting plan. This morning, it seemed to have started. Now, they didn't attack the orphanage, but they did kidnap Sister Marilyn. Jimmy said that although she was strict at times, she could certainly be described as a righteous soul. The three of them assured that they wanted to brainwash the poor girl into killing the children for them, thus breaking the seal. Little did they know that Pastor Morrison had something else in mind. Brainwashing was far too risky. There was no way of knowing if the subject would lose their mind and go after the clients instead. What they needed was a loyal soldier, and it just so happened that Lord Belial had one at the ready. A demon named Boca would do the job. Now, he was only a lesser demon, but it was easy to summon him and have him take over Sister Marilyn's body. The demon host had to listen to the death cries of two sinners for 66 minutes after the incantation was spoken. Sister Marilyn was tied to a chair. She was blindfolded and had earplugs in, and the kidnappers probably did this so that she wouldn't realize where she was being taken. What she couldn't figure out was, however, 
why in God's name were they kidnapping her? She had neither wealthy relatives nor friends. No one would be prepared to pay a suitable ransom for her, and it took almost an hour for the blindfold and earplugs to be removed. She wanted to try and have a sensible conversation with the kidnappers, but then she heard the men screaming. Two campfires were burning to her left and right. Two men were hanging over them. They were about three feet away from the flames. They were not burning, but they were literally being slowly roasted. Their screams were terrible. Marilyn begged the kidnappers to stop the gruesome spectacle, but no one listened to her. The strange pastor in the red robe had no sympathy for the men either. He just looked at his watch the whole time. None of this made any sense to Marilyn. The men were still screaming for help. They weren't burning, but their skin turned red and then burst open in several places. They must have been suffering terribly. It became stranger when the two men, whose skin was now burnt, and barely made a sound. The pastor then instructed two of his servants to give the poor men some water. What was the point? To keep them alive? It worked. The water apparently gave them some strength to endure the agony even longer. What Marilyn didn't know was that it was now the 66th minute. The victims were now hung directly over the fire and their screams became louder. Their clothes caught fire, and after a few more seconds, their death cries died away. The pastor grinned. A kind of dark portal opened up directly in front of Marilyn's feet. A dark mass that looked like viscous slime shot out of the hole and entered her chest. She realized what dark thoughts, desires, and aggression were spreading inside her. Then she was gone. Locked away in the furthest chamber of her mind, she was now just a spectator. Uh, that was fun. I'm hungry. I haven't eaten in centuries. Do you have anything to munch on? Uh, the demon asked. Uh, sorry, we didn't think of that. Eagle can get you something, replied Morrison. Oh, damn. You guys are great. Is the buffet for me? Thanks. The demon's gaze had fallen on the burnt men. He stood up, snapping the shackle that had held Marilyn captive with one hand, and he took one of the men from the fire and sat down with him. Then he bit the crispy grilled meat from his skull. I'm glad you like it. When you finished eating, I'd like to get going. Is that all right with you, demon? Asked the pastor. Call me Boca, pastor, and yes. I'm willing to serve Master Bilal as best I can. Do you want some, or can I have the other one, too? asked Boca, smacking his lips. It was amazing that so much could fit into a human stomach. Boca gnawed both men down to the bone. The sight was too much for even some of the cultists, and they left the cave. Pastor Morrison, however, didn't mind. He thought it was nice that the demon felt comfortable in his own skin. He slept on the journey to the orphanage. It was amazing how human a demon could be. You could only guess what a cruel beast was hiding under this masquerade called Sister Marilyn. When they arrived, Boca led the way. Pastor Morrison and two of his cultists followed the demon. Boca himself had never been to the area, but he had access to Sister Marilyn's memories. A young sister sprinted excitedly toward them. The demon recognized her as Sister Mariana. Sister Marilyn, there you are. We were so worried, she said. Uh, but my child, you were right to be worried, replied Boca. What? Before Mariana could make a sound, Boca bit out a large part of her throat. The blood spattered and stained the nurse's robes. On the way to their destination, the demon killed Sister Anja and Sister Mona. They were all on duty today as Boca could see in Marilyn's memory. No one would interfere with her plan. The children playing in the courtyard paused when they saw the bloodied sister Marilyn. Dear children, please come into the dormitory with me. I would like to introduce you to dear Pastor Morrison, said Boca. The children did not move, not because they were being disobedient, but because all the blood frightened them. 
I won't say it again. Move, shouted the demon. Now, uh, they all hurriedly got moving and gathered in the dormitory. Pastor Morrison was impressed. Everything was going like clockwork. The seal would soon be broken. However, there was one more thing he had to do, and he was finding it difficult. According to Belial, the ritual murders were to be carried out with the dagger of lies. Reluctantly, the pastor let the dagger out of his hand and handed it to Boca. He immediately began to twitch and tremble, uh, but he recovered after a short time. Without the wonderfully concealing veil of the dagger, he felt the fire much more clearly on his skin again. Boca enjoyed holding the blade forged in hell in his hands. You in front, the blonde. Your name is Lydia, right? Come here, please. I want to show you something. The demon said to one of the children. Lydia slowly started to move while the other children moved even closer together. Morrison counted them and realized there were 68 in total, so they had to leave two of the brats alive. The book said quite clearly that there must be exactly 66 children. Ten-year-old Lydia had now reached Sister Marilyn, who was now enjoying smelling her blonde hair. Then, unnoticed by Lydia, the demon pulled out the knife and was ready to begin the ritual. As with the breaking of the last seal, Janice Keebler and Aidan Goodman got involved this time, too. The only annoying thing was that this time they arrived before the seal was broken. And it wasn't just that which made Pastor Morrison angry. The author had even a revolver with him. He was prepared. Boca reacted faster than the others and held the knife to the girl's throat. Well, well, you're not going to shoot dear sister Marilyn, are you, Mr. Goodman? The demon grinned, knowing that the author had no idea who he really was. Let the girl go. I won't say this twice. The author raised the gun and pointed it at Sister Marilyn. Maybe now it would show if the target practice had paid off. Now, 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 who's going to get angry? Put the gun down and we'll talk about it, Mr. Goodman, said Boca. Aiden was sure he would regret it later when he pulled the trigger. But his own state of mind was not the priority here. The life of an innocent child was in danger, and so he had no choice. A small bloody hole could be seen on Sister Marilyn's forehead. The children screamed in horror, but Marilyn didn't fall over. She grinned. Okay, now you've made me angry. I'm finally back in a human body and then you just break it? shouted Boca angrily. He threw the girl and the dagger aside and walked toward the author and his girlfriend while his eyes turned black. Only now did the two realize that they were dealing with a demon. They slowly withdrew from the room. It was difficult to leave the children alone, but as long as Sister Marilyn, or at least her body, uh, was with them, nothing would happen to them. After all, they had to die at the hands of a righteous soul, and Pastor Morrison and his cultists certainly didn't count as righteous. Boca was speeding up now. He had followed Aiden and Janice into the hallway and jumped to the wall to crawl like a spider. Then, when he had caught up with the two pests, he jumped down again and kicked Aiden so hard in the stomach that he slid several meters down the corridor. Janice thought about using the dagger, uh, but the demon was quicker. He grabbed her by the throat and pinned her to the floor with inhuman strength. You smell funny, like magic. Let's see if you taste like it, too, said Boca. Aiden fired several times at his back, but the demon only smiled. He opened his mouth and was then hit by a small glass bottle. He was about to make a joke about how the author must be pretty stupid if he thought that would hurt him more than the bullets when he suddenly felt the burn. They'd thrown holy water at him. His skin was smoking, and he seemed to be in terrible pain. He pushed the woman to the ground again, and now concentrated on the cheeky author. You come first, you're brave, and that makes me incredibly angry, he shouted. Aiden fired his revolver at the creature from hell a few more times again, but it didn't bother. Furious, Boca knocked the gun out of the hack's hand, which slid down the corridor. At that moment, 
one of the cultists sent by Morrison to help the demon stepped into the hallway. Janice didn't think. She just acted. It wasn't a second before she was startled by the sound of the revolver. The Satan worshiper first sank to his knees and then fell face first onto the clean floor of the hallway. I've killed a human being, thought Janice. But then she stopped thinking and went back to action. Just as the revolver had slipped across the corridor earlier, she now slipped the white dagger she had received from Mirden over to Aiden. The author had the presence of mind to grab it and wondered how it felt in his hand. It, it, it didn't feel quite right when he held the revolver. Even with your knife, you can't hurt me, you fool, Boca said. Then he tried to bite Aiden's throat, but the author plunged the magic dagger straight into his heart. The demon immediately let him go and screamed terribly. His eyes glowed briefly, then faded. I have sold my soul and become a demon in hell. That is the truth. My existence now ends and I am afraid. That is the truth. Before the demon fell to the ground and died, his eyes filled with tears of remorse. Aiden, still amazed by the dagger. Not only did it make him feel good and true, but apparently it could kill demons. Now, they really owed this mage from the other world. When he and Janice checked, the children were alone in the dormitory. Morrison and the remaining cultists were long gone. But that didn't matter. They had made it. The fourth seal was still intact and the dark pastor's plan had been thwarted. A short time later, there was a knock on Officer Marston's door. When he opened it with his revolver drawn, there was only a note on his front door. We need our good doggy. You know the place right away. Good. Maybe now is the time. Marston was ready. Ready to kill and ready to die. After a 10-minute walk, he arrived at the warehouse. This time, he didn't sit down on the floor. The spectacle was over. He was surprised when the cultist, who usually humiliated him, didn't even notice that he was standing upright instead of sitting on the ground like a dog. He seemed excited. Okay, it's pretty urgent. I need your help. The pastor wants to see you. He wants you to come to our church. I have something else to do. You'll find us in the caves, three miles north of Moxton. Hurry up. The pastor doesn't like to wait. That was all Marston wanted to know. Now it could begin. The cultist fell to the ground as Marston shot him in the knee. You bastard, you'll regret that, the cultist shouted. He reached for his weapon, but Marston kicked him in the face with his heavy boots. Then he removed the cultist's weapon and threw it away. I haven't been your dog for a while. I've just been waiting to make you mine, said Marston. The demon worshiper tried to reply, but the officer kicked him hard in the chest. He squeezed his lungs, causing the cultist to cough and struggle to breathe. And as he struggled to breathe, Marston took one of the dog food cans standing around the corner and opened it. Then he saw some other utensils that the Inferno had used. Among them was a roll of duct tape. They'd used that duct tape to bind him and his partner Dick Freeman before torturing the poor man to death. So this gave him an idea. With the tape and the dog food in his hand, he sat down on the chest of his former tormentor. And without saying anything else, he stuffed the dog food into his mouth and up his nose. Then he covered his mouth and used the tape. Stuck it over his mouth, around his head, over his mouth again so that he couldn't spit out the dog food. And then last, but not least, he used it to tape his hands behind his back. It sounded as if the victim wanted to vomit, but nothing came out. It remained stuck in his mouth and throat because of the tape. The man's agony lasted several minutes. Cool and emotionless, Marston watched as he choked on his own vomit in the dog food. A fitting death for you, thought the man who was no longer an officer. He simply left the body there and made his way to the caves. Now, to do so, he took a guard car without anyone noticing. There were several caves north of Moxton, but the right one wasn't hard to spot. Not only candlelight, but also angry murmurs emanated from it. It was well hidden under a grassy mound, and one wouldn't have guessed it was so large. Marston was astonished when he entered and saw the large rooms. 
When the pastor saw him, he immediately pushed some of the cultists aside and made his way to him. Officer Marston, it's a pleasure to meet you. You are such an important part of our big family. Please, please come and sit down. Marston didn't answer, but surveyed the room, which was furnished as he imagined a church in hell would be. There were 16 cultists and the pastor. That would be enough. Now they would go to hell. This author, Goodman, he meddles over and over again, but that's over now. We're going to use him to break the fifth seal. A righteous man will die by 66 cuts from a weapon forged in hell. And I need them for that. You, in your role as an officer, will pick them up together. He and his girlfriend and the slave boy and drive them here. I will gather my dear sheep, and everyone can give him at least one cut, including you if you want. All I ask is that you hurry, said the pastor. So he would gather the whole colt. That was better than shooting only 16 of them, Marston thought. I'll be on my way in a moment, honored pastor, he said. With feigned reverence, he kissed the dark pastor's hand and then made his way to the rich author's estate. After the short drive, he got out, went to the ornate door and knocked. Tony opened the door for him. "'What can I do for you, sir?' the butler asked. "'I will need to speak to Mr. Goodman, Miss Keebler, and the young man. Would you fetch them, please?' Marston asked, trying to sound like an officer again. His voice was convincing, but the sight of him reminded Tony more of a sweaty and unwashed gunfighter than an officer. Nevertheless, he called his employer to the door. Aiden was sure that the visit was connected to the incident at the orphanage. The children had certainly reported seeing him at the scene of the crime. Good afternoon, Mr. Goodman. I'm Officer Marston. We have a few questions for you regarding a crime and would like to invite you to the police station. I would also like to ask you to have Miss Keebler and the boy come along as they are also important to our investigation. Aiden understood that. After all, Janice was also on the scene and he had only recently adopted Jimmy from the same orphanage where several murders had been committed. The three of them joined Marston in the car and drove off. According to the officer, they had to pick up a piece of evidence on the way and therefore had to make a small detour. However, the detour seemed strange to the three of them. They drove further and further away from the city and finally stopped in the middle of nowhere. Marston drew his gun. I'm sorry, Mr. Goodman. I'll have to ask you to get out slowly and keep your hands up. You too as well, Marston said. Aiden was annoyed. He should have known. The man was part of the Inferno. He remembers his name too. The young librarian said Officer Marston had shown no interest in solving the murder case at the library. So now it made sense. The three of them stood in a line and were herded by Marston into the cave from which the candlelight was now clearly visible. The sun had already set. Too bad, Marston thought to himself. He would have liked to look at that one more time before his eyes closed forever. The vicar smiled when he saw the three troublemakers with their hands up. While the two adults only looked grim, at least the slave boy seemed afraid. That was better than nothing, he thought. But the author and the woman would soon be trembling too, he was sure of that. It's a pleasure to welcome you to my church again, Mr. Goodman. Would you like to have another interview with me? Asked Morrison, laughing uproariously. No. No, I already know all about you, the author replied dryly. Whatever you say. Nevertheless, I'll tell you what's going to happen now. You prevented me from breaking one seal, and now you're going to help me break another. And the fifth seal will be broken when a righteous man dies by 66 cuts from a weapon forged in hell. Do what you want to me, but let Janice and Jimmy go. So they can continue their operation against us? No, uh, those two are just a little extra. And after we finally made a real woman out of Miss Keebler, she'll follow them into the afterlife. Say hi to God for me when you get there and tell him to go fuck himself. As the fear in Aiden grew, Marston's blood pulsed more and more. He couldn't count them all, but there had to be at least 40 cultists. That was more than he had expected. Maybe he wouldn't even be able to kill all of them. But that didn't matter. 
Marston, why don't you bring our visitor to his knees? Marston, do you hear me? Morrison asked. Uh, no, he hadn't. He aimed his eyes at one of the cultists who was carrying a weapon. The cultist noticed and tried to draw his weapon, but Marston was incredibly fast. In a split second, he pulled the revolver from his holster and fired from the hip. The bullet hit the cultist right between the eyes. Before any of the others could react and, or even realize what was going on, Marston shot a second one. That's for Dick Freeman, my partner. More shots rang out. That's for Albert Brenson. That's for Chief Calder. This is for Jenny Marston, for Hannah Marston, and for Shirley Marston, whose father and husband you took. And this one is for me. Marston had already killed over two dozen of the cultists and was now taking cover behind a crate at the far end of the cave. Some of the cultists who were not armed fled, leaving their pastor in the lurch. He was also cowering behind a crate with one of his loyal servants, not understanding what had gone wrong. Marston now emerged from behind his crate when he saw a cultist was targeting the author and his friends. He shot him in the heart and was then hit in the shoulder himself. But that didn't matter. That was part of his plan. He had lost sight of the pastor, but not the cultists. Another bullet hit him in the thigh and another in his left hand. His bullets always hit the cultists between the eyes or in the heart. He was an excellent shot. The last cultist he saw in the cave also fell to the ground, dying. Janice noticed something strange. She felt that vibration in her chest again. The surroundings also changed. The temperature rose and there was a slight breeze. She could now see some sand being stirred up on the ground. It wasn't there earlier. Officer, watch out, yelled Aiden. But it was too late. The demon worshiper who had been hiding with Morrison put several bullets into Marston's chest. None of them hit his heart, but his lungs were punctured. As a gush of blood ran from his mouth, Marston smiled. He had finally made it. He toppled over, looking a little distorted for a moment, and then disappeared completely. Neither Pastor Morrison nor Aiden could make any sense of this, but despite the confusion, Aiden quickly grabbed the revolver from one of the dead cultists and shot the man who had killed Officer Marston. Now, only the pastor was left, and Aiden certainly wasn't going to wait for the police to arrive. He would kill him here and now. Morrison came out from behind the crate with his red dagger in his hand. Aiden shot him several times in the chest, but the pastor didn't move. He was just laughing. His hooded robe was stained with blood, but he didn't seem to care. To make sure he was finished, Aiden put another bullet in his head. The dark pastor didn't even flinch, just kept smiling. Only Aiden, Janice, and Jimmy saw the blood on his chest and the hole in his head. He didn't see it himself. He saw himself strong, unharmed, and in the prime of his youth. That was the lie the dagger sold him and he accepted the lie as the truth. You can't hurt me, you little runt, because I don't believe in your truth. Nothing can hurt me, and you have no choice but to watch me slowly bleed you and your friends dry. Janice stood up and walked toward the pastor. Now she understood. She understood everything. None of what had happened was a coincidence. For every darkness, there was a light, and for every lie there was a truth. She drew the dagger she had received from Myrden. Even with your knife, you can't hurt me, stupid woman, he screamed. Why don't you try? The pastor snarled, spreading his arms wide. Janice pushed Aiden aside and plunged the dagger of truth into the cursed pastor's chest. Morrison didn't feel the dagger, but he suddenly felt the bullet wounds in his chest. He felt the truth. God hates me. That's the truth. I'm going to hell now. That's the truth. Morrison got a terrible headache, and then the world around him went dark. When he regained consciousness, he found himself in a large barn with the slaves he had once burned. In the cave, Jimmy came out of hiding and joined Janice over the pastor's corpse. 
The dagger of lies fascinated him. Aiden noticed that Janice looked a little absent, and somehow she blurred before his eyes. What was happening here? When he felt the vibration in his chest and saw that Jimmy was blurring too, he sprinted over to the two of them and pushed Jimmy aside. Jimmy was a little surprised and wanted to ask his adopted father what he was thinking. But he had disappeared, just like Miss Keebler. He was the only person alive on this battlefield. If what he assumed had happened to them both, he would reappear somewhere sometime. He took the dagger of lies and made his way home. He wandered away from the streets so that none of the cultists who had successfully escaped would see him. Jimmy Goodman arrived home safely. And then he waited. Hey, horror fans, want to learn more about the rise of the Demon Lords? Then subscribe and click on the next video.